on? Am I on? There we go. Hey, how's it going? Good to see everyone. My name is Dennis Baker. I'm the business program director. Thanks everyone for coming out. Good to see you all. Welcome to those who are watching on the live stream. Before we jump in, we're going to have our panelists introduce themselves. So how about we start right here? Hi, my name is Anya Adams. I am a director now, but came up in the industry as an assistant director. Happy to be here. Hey. Wrap it up. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> Hey guys, I'm Jolene Kay. I came up in the industry as an actor. I'm now a session director for commercials. Um, just in case no, if people don't know what that is, I'm the hired gun that casting directors bring in to tell actors where to stand, what to say. It's my job to get the absolute best audition from you I possibly can. There you go. Yeah. Uh, I'm Jennifer York. I work at DPN Talent as uh, the head of the commercial department there. Uh, that's about it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Diane Robin. I'm an actress. Um, I've been in over a hundred televisions and films. Uh, I've been hired to say hello, and I've been hired to star in things. So <laughs> I've been through all of it. Okay. Oh, well, let's give me a hand. Say thank you. So, to give you context of where we're going today. Um, Professionalism is such a broad topic and covers so many things, but also, in my research, it's so universal to so many different people, so many different people in the entertainment industry and not in the entertainment industry. So we're going to kind of take that broad scope for a while and kind of examine it through everyone's different experiences, different parts of where they work in their career, and then we'll slip in kind of the more specific actor things as we continue the conversation. Does that make sense for everyone? Cool. So we're going to jump in. I'm always curious to know people's backgrounds. So. Who were the mentors? Who were the teachers? Who were the people in your life that kind of guided you to help you understand what it means to be a professional in the careers that you're in? So we'll just start with anyone that has the first thought about that. God, no one wants this question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I started studying when I was in high school at Strasbourg. So very young, I got a real sense of what professionalism was. And I lied about my age, which I still do. <laughs> for different reasons. And um, throughout the years, I always tried to study with people I thought were fantastic. I said with Jeff Corey. And uh, I had a friend, Deborah Hill. I don't know if you know who she was. She did all the Halloween movies and Fisher King. And through her, I met incredible directors that I ended up working with. And um, I would say of anyone, she was my mentor. And I miss her. You, you go ahead. Uh, OK, I'll go next. Um, so I didn't start out wanting to even be in the industry. I was going to be a psychologist, which I'm sure you guys know is probably a good thing to have once you come into the industry. Um, but I did something called the DGA trainee program. And once I got out of there, the first show I did was CSI Miami. And uh, it was an incredible experience. I was there for about nine years. But probably my first really strong mentor there was a man named Sam Hill. Can you believe his name is Sam Hill? Seriously. Um, he is currently the producing director on Scorpion, but he was the first AD on the show when I started as the second second. And so we came up together, but he really taught me a lot about you know, how to be a good first, or first AD, but also just an AD and just how to navigate through the whole production experience and work a lot with actors, which is um, something ADs do, as you guys know. Um, I've been sitting here compiling a list in my head like it's an Oscar speech or something. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I've had, I mean, the biggest acting influences for me, um, Marcus Giamatti was one of the first and best acting teachers I had worked with. Um, and he, he taught a lot on that uh, concept of the long game and being a professional and making the kind of contacts and relationships that will, you know, help ultimately. Um, so Marcus Giamatti, and most recently, Risa Brahman Garcia is a wonderful casting director, and she teaches with a bunch of people that have, um, I, I feel like they teach me in, in sound bites. Uh, James Eckhouse has this wonderful concept of being the acting department when you walk into an audition room and letting everything else go. So there's that, Sean Sharma was the one that taught me to session direct, and then there are a ton of casting directors that have just helped me see how pleasant the casting process can actually be, which I think is super important, because so often it feels like it's not pleasant or everything's stacked against you, so. 
There you go. That's enough names. Thanks. <laughs> Jennifer? Yeah, I mean, I would jump in just because you and I are in sort of a similar line of work. Uh, I was taught by my aunt. She was a commercial casting director. And I think that those people have really taught me that, yes, there are good people doing that job, being a casting director. They're not all out to get you. They're not all uh, horrible people. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think starting with her and just moving forward with, you know, my aunt, people like Danny Goldman, and um, my God, I'm really going to go back for a second, but, um, you know, all of those sort of original Judy Elkins and Sheila Manning and, and all of these original people really started this business and really, you know, it just amazing their professionalism and how, uh, how they showed the rest of us the way, really. I remember Danny would smoke outside his office, and if you walked by, he struck up a conversation with anybody and everybody. It was hilarious. He was just one of I those. laugh because he used to call at the first agency I worked at. He would call, and he would, hi, it's Danny. <laughs> Danny, what are you eating? Celery. And I'm like, Danny, you've never had celery, ever. <laughs> those are chips. <laughs> And uh, I'll put you through. <laughs> yeah. nice. nice. Thank you for that memory. That was fun. Um, in my research, I was reading a lot of books and articles, and I came across a book called Turning Pro by Stephen Pressfield. Um, if Stephen Pressfield sounds familiar, he um, wrote the book um, The War of Arts. Um, and this was kind of maybe like a, he would probably classify it as a sequel. And he had 20 sentences of what a professional could be is aspects of that. So I'm gonna use that as our blueprint and kind of hit on some of those sentences and let you guys kind of riff on those sentences and talk about stories and kind of just have a chance for you to share from your personal experiences and people you've met and experiences. So I'm gonna start off with number one. He says, number one, the professional shows up every day, which seems logical, but is not always the case, as I'm sure agents and session runners no, not everyone shows up for their auditions, do they? So can you talk maybe a little bit about your experiences with people showing up or not showing up? And we'll start there and then... Oh, I okay. have one. Yeah? I showed up when I was not supposed to show up. Um, when I first started off, I had a manager, and she goes, whatever you do, just sneak onto Universal Lot, get into casting director's office, hand them your picture and resume. And I thought, okay. So... <laughs> So I snuck on, I got in the office, and I thought, oh my God, people make such a big deal about breaking this business, it's so easy. So <laughs> I'm handing her my picture and resume, and I feel this. And it's a security guard who dragged me out of the office and threw me off the lot. So I learned really young, don't do stuff like that, it's crazy, people don't like it. Uh, show up to meetings you're invited to, don't crash things, don't be weird, don't be stocky. The other part of that story is when I was in the parking lot, I said to this man, do you want to hear what just happened to me? He said, okay. And I told him the whole story. He goes, do you have an agent? I said, clearly no. If I had an agent, would I have done this? He said, I'm an agent. He goes, I don't have anyone like you. And I signed with him, and three months later, I was a series regular. So it's a weird business. It's just weird. I mean, here's what I can speak to. When you all get your series regular job, Remember where you are now. Be thankful every day coming in. Take care of your crew and the people around you. And if you're having a hard time, don't take it out on everyone else. I think like as an assistant director working with, I've worked with David Caruso, I've worked with Anthony Anderson, I've worked with you know, all these different types of characters. Um, and when you've been doing a show for five years, sometimes it gets to a point where you forget why you were doing what you were doing, or it seems to that be that way with the crew. Remember why you're doing what you're doing and come to work every day wanting to act and wanting to be a part of the process that everyone is working so damn hard to create for you. I, I hear um, a lot of times said the responsibility of being number one on the call sheet. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big responsibility. And I'll tell you, I have this great story. When I was a trainee, I got to be on the West Wing. And my first day there, I walk into set, and this man walks up to me and says, hi, welcome, my name's Martin. That's Martin Sheen. 
I didn't, I, like, I knew he wa I, who he was, but the fact of the matter is that he took the time to talk to a trainee. I'm not even a staff member on, the, you know, I'm a trainee, but he took the time to welcome me, and I just feel like that sets a tone. So you can do that, or you can be David Caruso. <laughs> no said. We know those stories. And scene. Let's talk a little bit. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the audition, because I, I know you have something to share, but I want to touch on one thing, because you mentioned the word crash. And I'm curious to get from your perspective and also from the agent perspective, there's a difference from crashing versus happen to be there, and if it appears by all circumstances one is right to ask. There's a difference and a balance, and sometimes it's not what you do, but how you do it. And that's ways to show up professionally, but yet still trying to get be proactive in opportunity. So can you maybe, t a little bit about that if you have experience or just kind of the idea of, of people showing up and not showing up? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's super helpful to know the numbers involved. I'm speaking about commercial casting exclusively here, but um, once you've been invited in for a first round, a first audition for something, you're one of thousands, thousands and thousands of people who submitted and you were chosen and you are now one out of 100, 200, something like that. It depends on the job. Um, but you've already won something by the time you've been invited in. The casting director knows what they're doing. And they've invited you to come in for that. So knowing that, I think it, it always astounds me when actors don't show up for that invitation. Like, you're one of thousands. What are you doing? Um, or I hear actors say things a lot like, ah, you know, it's so last minute and I have to drive across town. And you're like, yes. That's, that's how that works, and I'm sorry, that's, yeah, that's, you, you are to be available for those things, and that's what the industry expects. Um, and then as, as far as crashing goes, again, I, I think it's nice to reiterate that the casting directors do know what they're doing. They're so good at their jobs. They've, they've picked people based on the breakdown that they've gotten from production, and jobs change depending on which director is working them. So they'll call in a different crop of talent based on who's directing that spot. So I, a lot of the casting directors I work for will sometimes just come sweep through the lobby and see if they, you know, if they haven't gotten their numbers in that day of the audition that they want. They'll kind of, they'll start pulling people from other rooms or like, hey, are you, like, say you were perfect for something or you were like, hey, you got a great look. I'm going to throw you in for the Home Depot. You're like, okay. Um, and crashing, if you don't have a relationship with the casting director, I mean, just don't as a general rule, I would say. If you, if you do, if you have a lovely agent that has a bunch of nice relationships, um, I, I know actors who will, yeah, and they'll hang out. Actors will be at a place like 200 South and they'll notice that there's a job for whatever spot and the, the role kind of fits them. They'll see the lobby filled with people that look a lot like them and they'll get on the phone with their agent and be like, hey, was I submitted for this job? Do you think I can get in for it? And there are, there are tactful ways to crash where it's not then crashing you know there's a difference between like hey i'm here and i fit like i have people approach me at, at my audition room door all the time like hey i see you're seeing people that are my type do you care if i come in and look sometimes the answer is yes sometimes that that can happen um but yeah i it's feel like different I'm wrong, than but, per, but standing in pretending you're supposed to be there pretending oh. you're invited and so i think that's the yes. difference and that's is, yeah it's one thing to ask and a no is a no and you move on, but it's one thing to not even give that courtesy. Exactly. And if you if you creep <laughs> into somebody's room and it'll happen, you know. It yes, will, it will. Yeah, you <laughs> will end up seeing. And usually you can tell. I just I'll have a group of four people in front of me. I'm checking people in and I'm like, I, I don't know about that one. And I'll go check the LA casting database. And sure enough, they don't have a profile. And so then it's, you know, I'll ask, are you supposed to be here? Do you have an LA casting profile? And I usually get an answer like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, you, you got to get out. You got to go. I would say sometimes, too, what you don't realize is that maybe there's a special skill needed for that audition. Yeah. Maybe they specifically said, well, we really want girls with hair below their shoulders. And you think like, oh, but my friend's here. Why, why shouldn't I be auditioning for this? And you don't know those things. Um, I had a girl one time sign in, say she was with my agency, and the casting director is a good friend of mine, and she called me, and she said, is this girl with you? And I said, she's not. 
and it was a very ugly situation. I mean, she was asked to leave. She, it was just, it was a bad situation. So the best thing to do is call your agent and ask or ask nicely to the session runner, whoever's running the lobby. A lot of times they'll let you in. But the worst thing you can do is just sign in, pretend you're supposed to be there, because casting will catch you every time. Yeah, I guess, what, so one big distinction then is ask. Certainly ask, and you could get turned away or people get yeah. snippy, but don't lie. No, right. Like, don't lie. I don't, Well, like yeah. I said, you don't know. I mean, y you'll hear numbers like 3,500 people submitted for a role, 5,000 people submitted for a role, and, and so please respect that these casting directors have limited time, and they maybe are allowed to see 50 people, 100 people. Respect their time. Um, and just give it some time. You know, a lot of actors think like, I'm gonna sign with an agent and a month later I, I'm gonna be, you know, in a zillion spots. And the thing to remember is give yourself a chance. You know, give it a minute. I tell people it takes about a year from the time they sign on with me to like really get going. And, and some people it's less, but, but give yourself a break, you know? And I think a lot of people don't wanna do that. So don't pressure, you know, don't pressure yourself, don't push it. Be respectful. Be respectful of other people's time and w the decisions they're making. And it'll a lot of times it'll come if you're doing the right things. Well, I think what you said is so important about respecting the process. And, and again, I, I mean, I think numbers are, are helpful. Uh, so just so you guys know, when I get into a casting session at the beginning of the day, I like to check the schedule and how the office has laid it out for me. So say we're going from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., which is the most common time frame for a day of casting, and I with yeah. lunch from one to two, if that happens. Um, and I'm supposed to see, let's say, 100 people in that time. I can look at the schedule and tell you exactly how long, hey there. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, I can tell you exactly how long I can take per video per person to get done at five, which most of the time doesn't even happen. So when we talk about respecting the process, I mean, just imagine you're doing that math in your head and someone comes up to you and is like, well, I can dribble a basketball. Like, can I get in there? And you're just like, I, I want to help. I really do, but shit, you know? But they also, you know, keep in mind that production is paying for her time, for casting's time. They can't tack on a bunch of extra hours, a bunch of extra time to add 10 people who wanted to get in on something. So you know, trust the process, I think is really what it is. And it's interesting, because you said the P word, which is part of, of what we're talking about today, today, the idea of process versus outcome, which has many applications in many different areas of an actor's life, but it's the idea of the pressure of feeling like you have to con try to get a result too soon, or just not, a, like, and it's a small thing with a Christian world, but it's also a, in a career level as a whole, because also that's hard as an agent too, because you have to pay rent and you have to have your clients probably broking X amount of things happening for the business to happen. But yet you also know for yourself it's a process. And so having that kind of as a through line with also having goals at the same time. So I'm curious, in each of your individual's careers, how, does, how do you stay in process mode versus, oh, I really want that gig, or I have to have that gig, or whatever the case may be, or I'm trying to you know, make it to the next level of as a director. How do you kind of stay in like, the process at the moment? I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna be in this process. I'm just gonna let the outcome be whatever it is, whenever it is, and not feel like you have to control it, which is tough, and it's a big question. Thoughts around that, staying in the process? I mean, I'm just thinking, I, I recently made the transition from assistant director to director, but I have been talking about direct, like mo making that transition for a very long time. So in terms of staying in that process of making the jump, I think it's, you know, eyes on the prize, talking to people about what you want, letting people know, staying in touch with people that can help you and elevate you. and. Um, you know, be, as seeking out people that also can help you and elevate you and being polite to them and courteous, but also, you know, really expressing what you want. And the one thing I've found in, I know it, it may sound crazy, but people want to help you. They really do. They want to help you get to where you're going, but you have to, you have to be doing the work. So they want to help you do it, but they want to see that you are also like, busting your ass to get there. And so they, you know, then it's kind of exciting to be a piece of that. Um, I'm gonna jump into the second statement here in our, our um, quali qualities of a professional. Um, the professional stays on the job all day. 
which can have many different kind of connotations to that. But I also see it too as it's easy to check out as an actor. We talk about this a lot of time. It's easy to go on vacation on December 15th, right? As a simple thing of that. So in your experience, maybe it's, it's actors you know, maybe it's other professionals outside of the industry. How are they kind of staying in work mode for however long possible, right? And I think even think of casting directors. Casting directors are just like actors in the sense of they're always trying to get the next thing. They're always, and so it's just that kind of, how are you seeing people balance that idea of, okay, I'm gonna be working for as much time as I needed when, no, when I don't have a quote unquote boss. Mm. Kind of in a different direction, but kind of on the same thing. When I think of being on a set, from the moment you get there, you're on their time. And I've been on sets where literally my call was at six in the morning and they got to me at four in the morning. And you know, have to learn how to balance your time, your energy, your craft, everything. You can't, you know, I always say after you shoot something, there's no disclaimer that says, oh my God, she shot at three in the morning, she's so tired. <laughs> she was so much better earlier. You, you have to uh, realize that the time on a set, there's a director that every day has a very ambitious shot list. And it's your job as a director to help him make that happen by being there, where the, the AD's not searching for you, where you know your lines, you're in the right wardrobe, you're not the one going, oh my God, this is the wrong sweater, and running back to your dressing room to change and holding up production and having them reshoot everything because you had the wrong sweater on. You need to be in charge and responsible for yourself as a professional from the moment you walk onto that set to the moment you leave at night, and I think that encompasses a lot. Can I, like, can I add one thing? Just working with Lawrence Fishburne, one of the things he said, and I'm sure you guys have heard this, but um, as an actor, we're paid to wait. The acting's free, and I really think that's, like, that's the mentality that you need to bring when you are coming in as a day player or you're working you know, regularly. You're paid to wait. The acting's free, and that's true. You're going to wait. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When I, I mean, for me too, 100%, I, and I think that the waiting, um, yeah, I mean, you get onto set and it's the whole hurry up and wait thing, but I, we spend so much time not on set. Um, and for me, I mean, something I always tend to tell people when this thing comes up is, I, I, don't, think, I don't think you get ahead in this business by being bulletproof. I think you can get ahead by knowing where you're not bulletproof and that requires a really good team and that's not just you know agents managers a significant other whatever family um, people that, that can be there to support you and I think it is important to check out as in go on vacation but I mean I, I myself I always have a collapsible tripod my laptop I have my work tools with me wherever I go and I will check out but then I'm always ready at a moment's notice to you know, jump on that opportunity when it comes in. And then the team is super important for that kind of stuff. Well, I think that's from my perspective. One of the most frustrating things for me for, with clients is to my way of thinking, nine to five, Monday through Friday, you should be available. I have clients that will call, you know, my team will call at 10 in the morning and they'll say, why are we just getting this now? It's like, because I pitched you. Because right. I did my job and I pitched you and you're getting in this room. And it's like, no, I got to take someone to the airport or this or that. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. You know, I'm just like, all right, that's the last pitch call I make for you. And so as an agent, you have to understand that I'm there all day. If I just said, well, oh, like from two to five, I just didn't want to submit anymore. So I just like <laughs> stopped. <laughs> we just like stopped doing it. You wouldn't retain me as an agent. Be professional. It's a luxury to be an actor. You get to pursue what you love. Be taking care of yourself. Go to the gym, you know, go take classes, whatever it is you need to do to like keep yourself up. You're your own business. Remember that nine to five, nine to six, be available to your representation. We are trying to make money too. I don't make money until you make money. So be available. There's nothing more frustrating than texting someone or calling someone and saying you're on a veil for a project and not hearing. You know, be available. We're, we're there, we're trying to do a good job. Commercials are especially very last minute earliest I'm, I'm gonna know is maybe five o'clock the night before an audition occurs. Remember, respect our time. We've worked all day, we've worked to get you this audition. 
be around, be available. You know, treat it like a job, like a nine to five job. It's not just when you're on set. You know, you need to be present and available for your auditions, for your callbacks, be responding to your representation. We are all on the same team. I don't work for you, you don't work for me. We are a team and you need to remember that. And also, as an actor, it's not always the best time, and you still have to show up. I had a callback for a movie, and I just had toe surgery. And I called my agent, I said, oh my god, I said, my, my toes are like the bandages, and, and he goes, Diane, do you act with your feet? Who cares? <laughs> and I said, well, what am I going to say? He goes, tell me you had a toe job. I said, that's so obnoxious, I'm not going to tell him that. <laughs> so, I go into the callback, and at one part she falls down to her knees and she's begging her son not to marry this girl. So I get down and I think, oh my God, I can't get up. If I get up, I'm going to dig my toes into the ground, the band-aids are going to come off, the blood's going to go in the director's <laughs> face, I'm never going to get this part. So I just looked over the guy playing my husband, I said, just don't stand there, help me up. So he helped me up, and I ended up getting cast, and I remember thinking how I would have regretted it to not have gone to the audition because my toes were bandaged, or you're not feeling that great that day, or something's happened. You have to be available. There's not another chance. When your chance is up, do your best, whatever it is. I know there are days where you probably feel, my God, this would be a great day for audition. I'm feeling great. But then they call you the next day. <laughs> when you're thinking, my hair is bad, I look horrible, my stomach's bad, why today? But that's the day. So you pull yourself together and you go in. Mm -hmm. Clap that up. Take care of business. Shout out for Jennifer at 645 in the green room and she was doing work emails. If she's doing work emails at 645, clients, you show up for your appointments, right? That's what I'm saying. Um, number three here, the professional is committed over the long haul, which again seems like a no-brainer, but it's an easy one to kind of slip in and out of. I'm, I'm curious, I love to hear the stories of actors who love to do it no matter the outcome no matter if they make the series regular or no matter if they, if they get the big national commercial because it's, for them it's not about that. That's an outcome, if it happens, amazing, cash to check, but it's bigger than that, right? It's bigger than that and you, you share some examples. So do you have any examples of people you're like, you know what, they're in it for the long haul no matter what? Or, or thoughts or stories, because I'm just curious, because I think that feeds us when there's moments we feel like, oh, do we want to give up or do we not want to do it? I mean, I can think of, I'm thinking of two women, but um, Candy Alexander, do you guys know who that is? That's a, that is a woman that, like, I worked with her when I was an AD, but she was always a half an hour early. She knew her lines. It was always fun with her on set. And she worked one day a week on the show. I mean, some of you might be like, that's great, you know. But she was like, I don't care. I get, you know, two, three scenes and I'm out. Um, but I'm gonna kill those scenes. And, and it was just a pleasure to work with her. I knew that if she wasn't there a half hour early, something had happened, you know? She just was consistent and excited and happy to be a part of that. The other person I was thinking is Yvette Nicole Brown. Um, another woman that's just like truly dedicated. She's, you know, just did the mayor. Um, when I did a short fil film, I'd worked with her as a trainee on community. And I just connected with her and said, hey, I'm doing this short film. Would you be willing to be a part of it? And she was like, absolutely. Because she loves to act and she liked the concept and she just wanted to be a part of, of making something. So those are two women I can think of that. I... It's funny, well, the last two people that made a big impact on me that way, I actually saw them here, uh, Christopher Maloney and Ann Dowd, oh, yeah. both came, yeah, if you guys ever get a chance to hear them talk about their careers, it's awesome, and it's right along the lines of, you know, talking about how long they've been in it, um, what they've done, like Christopher Maloney has this awesome story about being in Runaway Bride. Does anyone remember that he was even in <laughs> Runaway Bride? Because no. that's what the joke that he makes. <laughs> and he was so, he, do you? Okay. So I had to think about it. Yeah. But you kind of have to remind yourself that he was there and, and his story about being in that movie and thinking, oh my God, this is, this is before Oz and Oz made him big. But being in that movie and being like, oh my God, with Julia Roberts and this is it and I'm going to be huge. And then the movie came out and nothing happened. And, um, and then him going through this depression about it and then uh, calling, I think he called the casting director of that movie and he was like, what the hell, you know, it didn't make it. She goes, Chris, you were cast to be forgettable. You did your job. 
You know? It wasn't about him. It wasn't about him. Yeah, and he has a, so there's this, this weird like twist in the story where he's like, oh shit, I did my job. No one remembered. Then he, he, it turned into a positive. No one remembered me. Um, and then of course he's got this huge, wonderful body of work now, and that was inspiring to me to look at that and be like, okay. When I, when I feel myself going to that bad place where I'm like, oh, I, I try to remember Christopher Maloney being like, sweet, no one remembers me. I did my job, you know? I think what everyone, actors have to remember too, is not everybody is gonna end up famous winning an Oscar. Know that just being able to pursue this as a, as a dream and, and as a passion is success in and of itself. You know, being able to do that, you're, you might not ever have these kinds of stories. That's okay. I have lots of clients who make great livings doing commercials, and guess what? They love it. It's fun. It's quick. It's, you know, it's quick. They, they're on television. They make good money, um, and they get to pursue a passion, and I think that don't feel like that's the only end game. You know, the only end game is this one thing. Remember that there are lots of different paths in this field, and, and just be happy that you're able to pursue it. I think the most successful clients that I have are people that just love it. Like you can just sense that they love it. They love what they do. They love creating things. They love writing. They just, they love the process. Love the process. Well, yeah, I think the, the, the long haul means something different to everybody. Right. I think that's something important to say. So it's not, and it could shift. Like the long haul to you might mean something today, but then three exactly. years from now you'll find and something else. don't so. measure success. You know, not everybody's success is measured the same way. Everybody has different goals. I mean, I, I don't know that I thought I'd be where I currently am. You know, I'm, I love what I do now, but it's like, you know, there were definitely some twists and turns there, I think we'd all say that, you know, and I just think being, being excited and being present and, and pursuing what it is that you love is success, you know, being able to do that, it, you're, that's success in your life. And I think that also comes from the idea of present versus holding on to the, the past or the future, the future being this one thing that I have to have or the past being regret, regretting something you didn't have versus I'm doing what I love right now. We're all in 2018 in, in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. here, breathing alive. Every, a callback means something. Like, right. uh, like you know, getting on a veil and means something. That. A lot of people enjoy mm -hmm. the audition process. You know, they just enjoy coming in, seeing you, you know, seeing friends, seeing other actors. It's nice, you know? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 no. I'm going to give an example of when it's not. No, no, no. And it's not about you. It's about actors. But I was going to say, everybody in this business, if you're a writer, director, producer, an actor, a singer, dancer, there's times where it's great and you're so grateful and you're humble. There's times where it's awful and it takes all your courage to pull yourself together and keep going. But I don't think anyone ever got in this business because it's winning an Academy Award. I thought... It's because of the love, love of the craft. Exactly. You love it. Whether you're doing little theater, whether you're doing a guest mm -hmm. star, whether you're doing one line, you just love it. And mm -hmm. I think that's the reason to be into it. That's what you need to remember. That's what you need to remember. No, what I was going to say about auditions, it wasn't that at all, but that I noticed, and I don't know if you as actors also notice this, there are some people when you're waiting in the room that are wonderful and they're like, oh my God, good luck. I just saw you on something, good luck. And there are other people that try to psych you out. And don't be one of those actors. <laughs> Always be nice to the other people in the room. Always be, you're all a team. If you don't get this one, you might get the next one. And I, I think it's such a better way of being than being that person that's a little vicious. The first audition I went to, I had no idea about what the room was gonna be like, the waiting room. And I was at Universal and I didn't sneak on. I actually had an appointment. <laughs> And I'm sitting there, and this woman says to me, she goes, how'd you get this audition? I said, my agent. She goes, oh, my boyfriend's the director. Yeah. And I thought, well, then why am I here if your boyfriend's the director? And she goes, why are you wearing that top? It's kind of awful on you. And I thought, why is she doing this to me? And I didn't know people would do this to you. So I went in, and I read, and they said, Diane, we just added another scene where she's crying. Do you want to do that? I was like, oh, my God, yes! <laughs> And I burst into tears and ended up getting that part. Um, but I learned from that, don't ever do that to other actors. Be kind to other actors. Don't compete in the room. Be each other's, you know, we're all in this together. Don't, be kind to everyone. We would just for the record, you beat out the woman whose boyfriend was the director? Yeah, it's a... <laughs> <laughs> that feels good. That feels good. Yeah, that feels good. <laughs> There's more to that story. <laughs> 
in line with this um, is another one sentence goes, the professional accepts no excuses. I've been at this job for five years and the amount of actors' excuses I've heard, I could write a book and I'm not even an agent. So I'm curious from the agent point of view, give me like the best excuse you've heard. I wanna like, oh, what's the best? The two other people from my office are here, so they're probably going to laugh because we actually have a list of amazing excuses. Oh. Um, of course you do. And we have a list of excuses that would have been better than what they gave us. Oh, boy. Oh, Lord. I mean, it goes on and on and on. What's I mean, I'm, try, I'm going to call them out and try and think what, what the excuses are that we hear. I want to hear because oh my gosh, people will say things in the room I mean, as Because well. I'm sure it's probably the same ones you, you've heard in the casting office. It's a lot of, it's, I know. Okay, please. Please, yellow, scream, yellow, it scream it out. Scream it out. The best excuse I've ever gotten was, oh, I can't. You know, I've got to go in time. And That's right. It, yeah. Okay, so repeat it for the people because on okay, video so, can't hear it. So. Uh, we had a client who was smitten with a lady that was in town, so he could <laughs> not make his auditions that day. He was going to stay with her. <laughs> or, yeah, cat sick. But, yeah, yeah cat sick. Yeah, but not ve cat sick, but the smitten with the lady was my, I think, my favorite. Well, I know there. Yeah. I mean, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but there are some weeks that I'm like, if Another this car. many grandmothers have died in Los Angeles, <laughs> we all need to take cover <laughs> because it's an apocalypse. Because it's literally twenty of them, and some of them, I'm like, your grandmother died two weeks ago. Why is she dead again now? My fa my my favorite is there was traffic on Wilshire. When is there not traffic on Wilshire? <laughs> yeah, I, the traffic, that, that is just, that's, please, yeah. that's just like par for the course. Uh, like the, 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 dead, the dead grandmothers, like I said, there was one week where it was just truly 15 or something, right? It was like 50, it was, it was double digits. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of just silly excuses, like I forgot to go. Um, I know that you gave me a time frame of between 10 and 12.45, that I just couldn't make it happen. Um, I mean, it's just, my car broke down is a big one, too. Standard, standard one. Yeah. So how about casting? Is it, is it those, or is it a little well, spin? I was gonna say, I always, I give points for originality, because some of this, by the time they're in my room, at least they've bothered to show up. Right. <laughs> But this, this interesting phenomenon happens when, uh, so we'll get done with the take, and you can tell when an actor's just like, oh, I, f I hate what I did, and you kind of watch them implode on camera, but, so the things that'll come out of people's mouths, like, I don't know, I don't remember what it was for, but, but it doesn't matter. After one take, I remember saying cut, and this actor looked up at me and was like, oh, I'm sorry, that was so bad, I just ran over a squirrel. I was like, <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Okay. As an excuse for the bad. As an excuse for the bad acting. Other others were. Pretty good though. Right. I mean, okay. There I'm going to use that. I love that. There was that's filed under creative excuses. That's well, and write I, that down. There. <laughs> write that down. But there was another. They they got done slating and they were like, oh, that, I said cut, and they're like, that was a bad slate. But I just, you got to understand, I just went to confession, and I'm in a weird. Place. <laughs> okay. I've also, no joke, gotten, uh, someone told me how constipated they were, and that's why their performance, I mean, well, whatever it is, it's, like, at some point, though, it's just like, I don't, it's okay. Just ask for another. Just, yeah, just, <laughs> <laughs> just don't so, I don't need the excuse, and, and also, my job is, if, if it wasn't good, I'll have you do it again, you know, or I won't present you to the casting director, or whatever, but, like, I just think it's funny that those excuses come out, like, oh, I'm not a bad actor, I'm just constipated. Sweet. Uh, okay. But there shouldn't be I, any excuses. I mean, yeah, I, that's the point. I say all the time, I'm not going to give an excuse for why things aren't happening. I'm never going to say my family or my kids. I, I never use these kinds of excuses because A, it's unprofessional, and B, I don't ever want someone throwing something like my kids in my face and saying, well, you weren't there because you're, you know, it's like, no, no. Just you do it. You know, I don't care about the process, I care about the result. Do it. When, how do you feel? I actually do have a lot of people, a lot. I have more people than you would think come in and say, oh, my agent told me I could come in in this time frame, or my agent said this or that. I mean, is that, I don't know, if, does that behavior ever get back to you? I mean, just don't. Guys, don't blame your agents for stuff. Mm. I mean, 
We get a lot of time frame requests, mm -hmm. I would say. I mean, that's just something else that sort of happens. Um, usually we try and limit them to like legitimate reasons. You know, if they've got a, a call back at a certain, you know, you've got a call back in Hollywood at 11, you can't be in Santa Monica at 11.30, but um, I don't, I don't, I feel like my clients wouldn't really do it. No, that's good. Then I you feel guys like, have good I, yeah, I wouldn't. They know better. Yeah. yeah. But I do hear that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm curious, because you talked about Martin Sheen. There was an, there's another story of John Spencer. Oh. Um, he would do the same thing. He would shake hands with everybody. He was always prepared. He would rehearse with actors uh, when he wasn't. All that kind of no excuses, we're going to get it done type of thing. But we also hear all the other stories as well. So I'm just curious, on set, how, how, how can we just make sure that they're even in the stressful moments, you know, when we got the big scene coming up, to just go, you know what? No excuses. We're going to make it happen. We're going to make it work. How do you work with actors who maybe you see, not that they're using excuses, but maybe you're a little nervous or a little this or a little that. They're like, okay, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna tackle this together. We're going to make this work. We're going to make things happen and get this problem solved. Another way of thinking about it, if that makes sense. I'm, that's a difficult question. Um, I would just say one thing for sure. Don't bring your phone to set. Be, be there. As soon as you are called to set, just leave your shit in the trailer and take your sides and, or don't take your sides because you know your lines and just come to set. Don't bring everything else with you. Um, and then I think if you're struggling with something or you feel like you're not connecting, you know, having a conversation with the directors and letting them know so that they can help you or talk you through something like, this isn't working for me, how do I get to X? A great example is I was just doing a, it's not a great example, but it's an example. I was just doing a scene where the actor couldn't want run, but I needed the actor to run down this hallway. So, you know, my, my pitch to her, her was, okay, I just need you to walk quickly, turn, say your line, and then keep walking and turn, say your line, and then I'll, I'll cut in between it. Because she was like, I can't run. I, I don't know how to do this. And so, you know, I, I already had a kind of resolution for it, which worked out, and we used a double for running. And I kind of, that's what I said, you know, we're going to use a double for running, it's going to look great, I just need you to look like you're in a hurry, and this, and then I kind of did it for her, I didn't give her a line read, I did not, <laughs> but I, you know, I kind of did the movement for her to show her, so it's just, you know, being, being in the trenches with y'all and figuring it out, and, and that's, I mean, a big part of once you start shooting, once you get that job and you're on set, is you're a part of this team that's collaborating to make this awesome thing, and, you know, the more excited and invested you are in it, the better. You can go overboard with that. Um, I did, I do have an example of a guy that had like two lines, it was on Blackish. It reminded me of the Passion f Fish, you know, have you ever seen that movie, Passion Fish, is that what it's called, Passion Fish? Passion, no, okay, anyway, it's this woman talking about, um, an anal probe. She's like, she's an actress and she's like reciting the line over and over in different ways. Like if you get a one line part, it's probably the way it is, you know, reading like, um, like uh, you just got here, you know, maybe that's your line. Like you don't have to pull the director to side and talk them through like <laughs> how you might deliver that line. Just give some options when you're rolling in rehearsal, you do something, see how it works. But um, you know, I, I did have an, an example where a guy came in and his, his line was, here's your black card. But he, he like way went deep and pulled the director aside and we're all waiting as he's having this conversation about how to say, here's your black card. Like, that's all you got to say, dude. Um, so don't, you know, there are times when you can get too, too invested in it. Don't make it a meal. Don't make it a meal, yeah. And I um, think if... Pretty much what you did the audition, am I right to say, that's kind of what they expect you to do on set. They don't expect you to then come in and say, oh, I'm going to do this with a French accent today. <laughs> it, yeah. They want to see you do, and you've got to have done your homework, be prepared 100%, yeah. so you're not going there going, can I ask a question? It's kind of past question time, especially in TV when it moves that quickly, unless it's something really specific and it's a little tweak, but mostly they just want to feel safe knowing, we loved what she did, she's going to come do it on set, there's not going to be any problems, it's going to be easy for everyone. 
isn't that kind of what you that's, want? That's absolutely it. And like, if you get a chance to go to the read through, a lot of times people, like the writers, they're there, the creators, there, everyone's there. And and usually, the way you read in the read through, they really like. So it's like, hey, remember, how, remember how you did it, and just do that, and that would be awesome. The other the other thing that just happened to me is I hired this guy to do a little bit part, and he had like this comic line at the end, and I just had him run it a couple times, which is also. Be prepared to give your spin on it. You know, if the director's like, hey, can you just give me that line three times, you know, just to knock it out? Give it three different ways, you know, and take a beat, like do the line, do the line again, and just give options, which is awesome for, for directors, especially in television when you're moving so quickly and it's not like a feature and you have an opportunity to spend a lot of time. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the phrasing of the sentence, because I think it's fun. The professional plays it as it lays. Oh, it's like a golfing. Yeah, it's thing. a little kind of golf thing, but it's the and, and I just want to hear. It's, it also reminds me of improv, of being in the moment, of not being bitter about whatever circumstances in front of you that you have to deal with. And I'm sure every one of you, things just come up where you're like, I, "This is not the ideal, but this is what I have to handle." So I'm just curious from you. Because we as actors, as we've talked about, things come up that day and we have to adjust and actors are always kind of in that mode of adjustment according to what material. I'm curious to hear from you guys, casting sessions, on set especially, when things go, you know what, this isn't as planned, but this is what we got in the moment and we got to figure it out and just make it work for the best. You guys have any I, I have a great example. I'm a sick actor in the last show I was directing and I had to shoot the scene so we had to use second team in there to replace the actor that was sick. And the other actors were so great. They just get, you know, gathered around that second teamer, we dressed her, and we just like shot this thing. And, and I just was doing the cut, and it looks awesome. And it's because everyone was super invested, and it was like, okay, this person's gone. We're gonna make it happen. How are we gonna do this? We staged it, we ran it a couple times, and it worked. So it's just, it's all about being game. And like, I mean, you know, you kinda gotta be flexible. And also, I would say, you come rehearsed for a part, but then you sit there with eight other people and you're creating a scene, it may go differently than how it was in your head, and you just got to go with that. Directors, too. I, from, from, a, from running a camera and casting's point of view, I, oh, I lost my train of thought, but, but I was going to piggyback on what you said, um, but just being able to, it never, that's what I was going to say, it never goes the way it is in your head. <laughs> Never. Yeah. Um, auditions especially, I mean, I, that's what I, what I watch, I feel like, most. It's like the biggest thing. If I'm seeing 200 people a day, I'll watch a bunch of actors implode when, when they've come in and they've prepared something. And I say, hey, guess what, we're going we're gonna to do it this way now, or you're going to walk and talk, or wh whatever the direction is I've been handed by the casting director or the director. And it, and it really will throw people. And I understand that. I'm not, I'm not making an argument for that being fair, but that is, to me, that's part of your job as an actor. That's the acting department's job, is to go, okay, that's not what I had in here, but uh, let me, okay, that's, I, I hear you, you're asking for that, let me, let me see how I can make that work. Um, and sometimes, and I always respect actors who are, and again, you, I, I don't expect anyone to be bulletproof, but if an actor comes into my audition room and I say, hey, they've changed this up, or they've gotten rid of this line, and we're gonna do it this way now, and they look at me and they go, okay, great, I'm gonna need three minutes, I'm like, Fantastic, great, you yeah. take your three minutes, I'll bring you back in, I'd much rather have you come in prepared and feeling good about it. I feel like actors do this thing where they're like, yeah, great, I'll do it, and they're clearly not, you know, they're not, they're not in the place to do it, but you have in your head, I gotta deliver no matter what, but, but know yourself, and if something throws you, then don't, don't lie about it, it throws you, that's okay. Um, I think professionals feel that, adjust, and then do what you got to do to take care of yourself and do the job. Right, but know? in additions, who doesn't feel this way? You do it, and they go, okay, I love what you're doing, but, and they give you an adjustment, and you think, oh, you didn't love what I'm doing, you hated what I'm doing, oh my God, what, the, what am I doing? And, and your mind's like spinning, and you have to just stop all that to be able to hear what do you want, give me three minutes, I'll come back, let me give it to you, and not feel that my choice was wrong or they didn't like it. Maybe they loved what you did, but they just changed something. I, I was auditioning for something once and the description was a bubbly, effusive realtor. So I can do that. So <laughs> as I'm reading, she goes, um, I, I'm gonna have to stop you. Um, She's not bubbly, she's not effusive, she hates these people. And I went, 
oh my God, that's much funnier. She goes, yeah, she hates them. They're annoying. And it's the same thing. I said, can you just give me some time to go out and process that and come back in? So sometimes things change in auditions. It has nothing to do with you. They change the script. They've changed an idea. They've changed the other person. And you have to not take it personally and be able to breathe and say, just give me a few minutes and I can come back and I can do that. I, well, I think the analogy fits. It's like, yeah. I mean, can you guys imagine a golfer whose ball you know, ends up in a sand trap and he's like, oh, if only, I don't, well, let's talk about it. And let's, I don't know, let me look you at every club. It. Yeah, you know, or he just picks the wrong club because he's in a hurry and this, anyway, I'm killing the analogy. But it's, it's the same. I mean, know what's in your tool belt, know, just know how to handle those situations. And if you don't know, it's, I mean, say you don't know and one of, you know, somebody, I'm always, help, I'm always happy to help with that in the audition room, you know. I would say too, like as a director, we're sitting at the monitor and watching, and then it's like, oh, wouldn't it be great if X did Y? And so then we come and give you a note, and it's true, we liked what you did, but let's try this and see how it affects that and that and that. So when you get notes after you've done a take or two, it does not mean that what you're doing isn't good. It just is like, we're watching it and seeing things and thinking, oh, what if I get into editorial and I want to go this way? Then I need to have this performance. So I'm going to cover myself and get a couple different ways. So please know that, that just, you know, because we're giving you notes on, on what you've done does not in the least mean it's not good. I'm going to start jumping in the audience questions. If you have some more necklaces around, you can jot some down. Um, forgive me, because I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong. Is that Kiho? Kiho. Hey, Kiho. Um, his question is, I'm 21 years old and just moved here two weeks ago from Boston. Woo! Welcome. Yeah. There you go. Boston represent. Um, what is your one piece of advice for him and others in his situation to have great success as an actor? So maybe stuff you wanted to hear when you were 21 or stuff you would encourage the 21-year-olds and their of who have been here for two weeks. There's probably a lot, but we'll, get, we'll have him give you one. He's been here for two weeks. What is the one thing he needs to know right now? Here's, okay, I'll jump in. Here, here's something that I've I've started saying a lot um, to people that, and it doesn't matter, new or they've been here for a while or whatever. I have a lot of people, regardless of what their um, experience level is, be like, oh, how do I get an agent? How do I start going out for jobs? And I immediately just go, well, hey, are you any good? And if they can't answer that right away, I know, I already know, you know, like, hey, that don't don't worry. It's not going to matter. Don't don't rush to land an agent. Don't be like, oh, I got to join the union. I got to get an agent. All, all this stuff, which ultimately doesn't matter if you're not awesome at what you do. If you don't love what you do, you know what I mean. I mean, I think we've all kind of been hitting that point over and over again. Um, but yeah, so so to condense all that, I mean, you got you're 21. Congratulations on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, find. Don't, don't rush to these, these milestones that are going to seem so important right away. Make sure that you're good and you love what you do and you, and you have a, a clear vision for what the long, the long term and that big goal is to you. Um, so is that, does that, is that helpful? Yeah. All right, perfect. And I would say study, obviously. Do theater. I know I'm old school in the old days, that's how you used to do it. You would study, you do theater, you invite people to come see you. Now I know there's a whole social media thing and people do things differently, but be trained. And I think the bottom line of what everyone's talking about is learn early to be a pro. Be prepared, do your research, show up, be on time, be enthusiastic, be ready to play, be a team player, be nice to everyone on a set from every, every department is important. Um, have that work ethic starting out and I think that serves well in anything you do. Yeah, a community can really help with that as well. Surround yourself with people that you really enjoy working with, who you know you can you can kind of rise up together. That, that's so helpful. I would say on the practical side, like get do a short, understand what it's like to be on set, know what the cameraman is, and know all those people that you're going to be working with, so you don't walk into your first job going, you know, asking the wrong person the wrong thing, because that that's not good either. One of the first things I say to someone, especially a young actor when I meet them is, 
you know, whose career do you admire most? Is there someone's career? Do you want to, are you funny? You know, can you cry on cue? Are you going to be a stunt person? What is it, what is it that drives you? You know, a lot of people just take UCB because that's what they're told to do. And that's not the right fit for everybody. If you love it, do it. The first thing to do is figure out who you are and where you want to be. And then from there, you can figure out which agent is right for you and which classes are right for you. You know, don't just be blindly guided by people because that's what they tell you. Figure out who you are and where you want to go and then make your choices from there. And a quick, and this, this will serve you commercially and theatrically, but special skills and other interests that you have, em embrace them. There was a time, I mean, good Lord, eight, 10 years ago where I, I was only booking things as a rock climber, not as an actor. But then eventually, casting director's like, oh, you're, you're a rock climber you're that can act. Holy <laughs> shit, you know, why don't we do that as well? Yeah. I mean, so, so, yeah, to piggyback on what she said about, you know, blindly going forward, um, those, those things that make you unique can really help as well. And don't lie about what you can don't do. Don't lie. Oh, my God. I once told people, it was a low-budget film, and they didn't have a stunt double, and they said, can you do stunts? And I went, oh, yeah, I dance. I could do stunts. Why did I say that? I regretted it. I made a big mistake. I'll never do it again. So don't ever lie about what you can and can't do. That, that's why you had to have toe surgery. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's very good, honey. Yeah. We, we, uh, I was on um, Body of Proof and we cast a young lady for the teaser and the teaser was this girl's driving around down a dark road, she runs over a dead body, gets out, sees it. Girl comes to set, she can't drive. Don't go, like that <laughs> fucked up our entire night. It was awful. So just know, and, and everybody knew her name and nobody was like, no one wanted to hide, you know, like, it was like, that girl's not going to work with me again. And you never know, like, the people you meet on the bottom coming up, like, I still know that person. So just know that. Don't lie, because it really can mess things up. Mm -hmm. um, Kelly C., where's Kelly C. out there? Hey, hey Kelly. Um, I have a long one. Yes, you do. <laughs> I'm going to classify her question under the, um, the, the theme of proactive versus permission. Being a proactive actor versus permission, it'll make sense when I ask this question. So there can be a blurred line between taking a calculated risk and being unprofessional. At times we hear about success stories of those who thought outside the box, who did something you're never supposed to do in an audition, I included that, but that idea, you know, the Edward Norton story is a big one, those type of things. And it helped their career or gave them the opportunity or their break or whatever the case may be. Do you have advice on how we can use those calculated risks, we can have calculated risks, but not kick ourselves for, for being unprofessional. That balance of risk taking versus being unprofessional. Proactive, but yet not too much, right? Yeah. You guys. Jump, go for it. I, I once delivered my picture and resume in a pizza. Don't ever do that. It was the most psychotic thing I've ever done. Don't do crazy things. You're not the only person I've, I've ever not. heard do that, Are actually. Are you serious? No. There was an actor who delivered a bunch of pizzas to a casting facility with their headshot glued all over yeah, I've it. I've seen some <laughs> Don't do that. I've seen some work. Doesn't work. The problem is you're hearing about outlier stories. You're hearing about these stories like Steven Spielberg sneaks on to Universal and builds a little studio for himself and somehow becomes Steven Spielberg. But you, what you're not hearing are the thousands of other people who tried to do something like that and were thrown in jail. So it's like, don't, don't assume just because this one person did something that seemed like a calculated risk or took a chance and they succeeded that that's, that's gonna be what happens. I think it's important to be proactive, being proactive and, and being on it, you know, I like it when my clients email me, give me updates, tell me what you're doing, what's gonna help me to pitch you. If you're at an audition, ask someone who's a session runner if you can get in there. That's dramatically different than just signing in and going into an audition. I heard about a girl who just uh, crashed a call back the other day and it's like, sh she didn't know she had to speak Spanish, she walks into the room, the clients are there. And so these are things that, and now everybody remembers this girl crashed the audition. She wasn't right for it. It was totally unprofessional. Um, I'm sitting right here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I didn't. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. 
So, you know, I think that I think that don't take the few stories you hear. I mean, obviously they're beautiful, amazing stories. We love it, but don't take those few stories and think that that's appropriate for everyone because if everybody did that, it would be chaos. It would be chaos. You need to be respectful, but you know, be be proactive, and being proactive is like sending you know your agents emails, taking classes, meeting as many people as you can, following up, following up on those relationships. A lot of very successful actors will email the director after they've worked with them and just say thank you so much, or you know send them a note or whatever it is. Um, I'm speaking more commercially. I don't know how it works theatrically. Maybe that's not appropriate, but. Um, you know, those are the people that have the most success that take do that extra step. So there's a difference between taking that extra step and doing something that's grossly inappropriate and, and, and crazy. Right. Well, like you're talking about doing a short film, that's a calculated risk, right. and that's a smart thing to yeah. do. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. And, yeah, and I was gonna say, in, in casting too, I, I feel like a lot of the stories we hear are somewhat dated. Timelines for casting mm -hmm. now are so much more condensed than they used to be. So, and, and I think it's important too to define what taking a calculated risk is. In my opinion, you can't calculate a risk unless you know the players involved. Maybe you ha you've read for this casting director before. There are things that will open you up to taking those kinds of risks. Um, you know, and, and having a really good skill set and knowing what your strengths are and all, all that stuff plays into that. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not the final word on this, but I've not ever seen anyone come in and do something crazy and just wow, so, yeah, just wow somebody by being a crazy person. Um, well, like I said, like the girl who signed in through my agency, I think she thought I'm going to book this and then somehow I'm going to be dazzled by that. And instead it completely backfired. It just irritated me, you know, and it just caused me to say, no, I'm not representing you and I'm irritated. Um, so though that's how it can backfire so like I said if you're respectful you're doing you know you're just being proactive that's what you need to do and, and yeah do things like create your own content or whatever it is that's important but not these other things and I there's something I always encourage people to do in an audition room and I think this works both theatrically and commercially but there's I think this idea of taking calculated risks too comes from a maybe an insecure place that actors have once they're in the audition room of like oh, I don't know what I can do and I just want to do it right and and so if you do have an idea and you feel passionate about it instead of actually asking for permission which would be like hey do you mind if I do this just get in the habit of going, hey, I have this idea, does this work for you? And then you're collaborating with casting. You're not like, do you mind if I do a weird thing, you know? And they can always say no, you know, oftentimes they do, but every once in a while they'll say yes. And I've had people come into commercial auditions with great ideas that I didn't think of because I'm, you know, trying to make my day. Um, and it's wonderful and they get called back and booked and whatever, and that to me is a calculated risk, so. Or doing positive things to get yeah. noticed, I think. There's a term we, um, we talked about in the green room, self-awareness. And if, when you have a lot of that, some of these questions get answered for you. Some of those type of things. I have a question for Anya. I think this person's done some research because I think it's appropriate for you. Christopher, are you out there? Where are you at, Christopher? Excellent. Christopher is an eight-year-old kid, as if you couldn't tell. Maybe he's seen your short film because you've worked with a lot of kids. So he wants to know, how does he go about as an eight-year-old networking with people like you? <laughs> you come to events like this. You're already doing it, my and friend. And you ask questions, which is a great way to do it. And then, geez, I don't know. I'm not an eight-year-old child. I've never, I never acted young or anything like that. So I think that's difficult. I don't know. You guys might be able to speak more to how young kids get involved. I mean, I, I think it's so... Is your parent here? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, that would he be drove the here. first he question. Just, he, drove here. he drove here. <laughs> he drove here. He's that proactive. Um, I mean, doing this is great. Um, getting involved in short films. I think, yeah. like, short films to me is such a great inroad because... Um, you know, actors that are big want to direct, so they're putting together projects, and then you get to meet them, and there's other people that are supporting them. Like when I did my short film, half of the half of the crew and cast from Blackish helped me out. So it's like if you're on that in that team, you're meeting all those people. So I mean, to me, that's a good way to do it. Yeah. I don't know. And I think as an eight-year-old, I mean, it, it's easier to like have people consider you they're not expecting you have a huge body of work yeah. they're just yeah. expecting you to come in have a great personality yes. participate listen um you know and that's 
you know, it's, it's easy, you know, in, in a way easier for, for kids, you know, just to, to start moving forward in that way. I would second that. I mean, if you're uh, Christopher, right? Yeah. Hey, are you, are you in classes and do, oh, great, man. Well, yeah. I mean, if good Lord, if an eight year old walks in and they do a great job, I mean, you've, you've made a fan One. already. Yeah. I mean, are you out auditioning and stuff? So, why dude. are you asking us for help? <laughs> How do I get a job with you? Hey. Yeah, it feels like it's it's a matter of time. Yeah. You know, if you're in there doing a great job and being yourself, and it's only a matter of time. I would say one thing, having worked with a lot of kids, yeah. it's easy when you get on set and you're like in a classroom or at a party or whatever, where it feels like that's where you are, but you're really on a set. So remember, when you're working to you know, somebody says, go stand over there and wait, just go stand over there and wait. Don't start talking to someone else or grandstanding or anything like that. You're on set because you were cast because you are perfect for the part. So you don't have to prove anything for, to anyone, but don't, don't get too comfortable where you are either. Just maintain your professionalism the whole time. Because you can see a lot of kids uh, uh, start chatting and stuff like that and it gets really chaotic. So if you can stay focused, that's really good. You'll stand out. Yeah, focused eight-year-old, man, you'll be working a lot. Um, Actors Fund has a program for kids. If you don't know about it, go check that out, actorsfund.org. They will um, free stuff for you. So um, thank you. Uh, is that Michaela? Michaela. Hey, Michaela. Hey, um, what is something you would recommend gifting? Is that the word? I can't quite read it. Gifting for when an actor wants to show their gratitude and appreciation. So agents and casting directors, directors too, you get a lot of gifts, right? Um, you, you, no, you don't. Well, we'll get you some gifts. We'll make it happen. But it, but sometimes it's again going that appropriate. Sometimes it gets a little not appropriate or a little too much or just not. Sometimes not. 100% necessary. Yeah, we've established no pizzas. No pi pizzas. So, well, yeah. pizza, just not with your photo yeah. on it. Yeah. Pizza's fine. So, <laughs> what has been good experiences in your world of actors just appropriately saying thank you? That's the thing what it comes down to, appropriately saying thank you. We have a client who, when she books, um, gives a gift that has to do with the commercial she booked. So, it's, very thought it's always very thoughtful and appropriate, and, and it's just, you know, things like that. I think if you can find out what someone likes particularly or give them a gift certificate to something that's close to their home or something like that, those are the kinds of things that people appreciate. I mean, it's kind of strange when you live, you know, in Silver Lake and someone gives you something to Santa Monica. It's like, you know, things like that. I mean, if you're, you know, if you're thinking, you know, of giving a little token or whatever, those kinds of things are always appreciated, I think appropriate for casting directors, directors, any, anybody, I think that's appropriate. Things well, I, I keep are written thank you notes. Absolutely. I ha it's so rare, and when people write just a short little note to mm -hmm. thank me or mention something that happened in the shoot, that I, I have those. I was actually putting them all together at home the other day, so those are really special. Yeah, I would second that. It's um, I've never seen a handwritten note go over poorly. Yeah. That's always a win. Um, definitely, I mean, it's pretty easy to get beta on casting directors, honestly. Yeah. As, as somebody like me yeah. who works with them or the lobby assistants or whatever, just go up to them after your audition, you know, or what, whatever you're, you know, what do they, what do they like? You but know, they're not they expect, nobody's no. expecting anything. I think I yeah. know. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally, but I've, I've definitely, I've seen a lot of actors apply this, like with a pizza with their face on it, or they, they apply this like, oh, I'm gonna give a gift that's so unique. There's there's one guy that plasters his headshot all over a little hand sanitizer oh, bottle. tissue box, no, it's tissue a tissue box. box. Yeah, there's, no. he, oh, yeah, yeah. he changed, oh, he changed to a tissue box. box. Yeah. And, and maybe there's one casting director I've ever met that's like, that guy's awesome. Everyone else is like, no, it's like, what a freak, you know, just like, what, what do I do with this? You know, they're given, or, no, oh, and I think I know who you know. I think is Lasso. Great. He's watching. He's watching this, and he's yeah. like, "Oh, great." Um, <laughs> but no, yeah, no, there's nothing wrong with it. I just, if you're gonna go for being effective and memorable, like every, yeah, exactly, that kind of vulnerability that goes beyond just, you know, here's my face on something. But just the thank you. Know, you. I yeah. mean, I had a casting director book a client on a series of three. Ford spots and he never said thank you to the casting director and some people don't care it's like it's my job or whatever but this office it bothered and mm -hmm. 
I've seen that they have lost a little bit of interest, and I know because they mentioned it to me that that was why. So it wasn't about necessarily giving a gift. It was just like the lack of gratitude for, um, you know, bringing them in out of all the people they could have brought in, getting called back. You know, you also don't, what you also don't see in a callback room is sometimes when there are clients, the casting director is saying, but this guy's really good. Oh my gosh, you guys. You know, but you should really consider this person. Well, and, and go ahead, go ahead, know. sorry. No, no, I mean, you can speak to that too. 100%. Um, and also think to how little credit casting gets most of the time, which should, again, tell you how, how far a thank you will go, but they don't, you know, especially for commercials, you'll, you'll know the, uh, the ad agency, the client, of course, all that stuff you'll know before uh, the casting director's name. So it really goes a long way when actors are just, it goes back to self-awareness too. Just, hey, thank you, I wouldn't have this job if you hadn't called me in. But also don't forget, again, the people as they're coming up. You know, many assistants and associates in a couple of years become casting directors and thanking them and showing them that, you know, you're appreciative. Sometimes they do the first pass of yeah. the pictures. You know, they do the first pass and they pass it off to casting. So it's important for you to show them that you're appreciative too. And, and I have to say from my perspective, if people don't respect the two other people in my office who are working really hard, it's not, it's, it it's a, leaves a very bad taste for me. Oh yeah, and you can ask you know, the session directors of the lobby assistants if you're not sure. I mean, you'll know the casting director's name because it'll show up on the email. That's who the company's named after. But if you can find out who their assistant is, who their associate is, and you, you and address- And just say thank you. Yeah, even, you address you know. the thank you card to mm -hmm. all of them. Like, oh, they, they love it. That's such a nice self-aware thing. Mm -hmm. I remember, um, and sometimes ADs become directors. Um, I remember on a film, an AD, he's so memorable because he would just simply like he invited, he verbally invited you on set. And it's like, I was just like, not, uh, not necessary, but just the idea of recognizing human to human, I wanna just welcome or thank you or just, and I think human to human, if all else fails, human to human, right? Um, we have another student-ish question. Katie, Katie, are you out there? Where are you at, Katie? Hey, Katie, she's a senior theater major at USC and graduate in May. Yeah, you are, congrats. Um, she has an agent manager manager rep question. Um, how does she go about that process coming out of school, submitting to agents, reaching out to agents? What is your recommendation? Because she's she doesn't quite have the relationships yet. She was in school. How does she? Is it just blind submission? Someone she knows? What would be your recommendation for her to reach out to reps and start kind of introducing herself? I mean, probably the. Uh, referrals are probably the best you know for me at this point it's nice to know a client is vouching for someone and saying they're professional they're talented because if I usually clients refer like clients you know they refer people who have a similar skill set or um, are at a certain level and so I tend to take those more seriously than a blind submission um, so that's probably the best and easiest way yeah. But I open, you know, we, we look at all the submissions and if someone's interesting or, you know, something that we might need on the roster, you know, we'll certainly take the meeting. I try and reply to all the emails because I know it takes a lot to like put yourself out there and send the email in the first place. Um, but referrals are really the easiest way. And, and are you good? <laughs> Wait, where, where is she, who asked the question? Hey. Hey, hey. Um, yeah, how do you, do you feel good about your work and your online materials and all that? Oh, great, fantastic. But like a short, you know, a short to the point email, if an email is like many paragraphs, I'm like, oh no, 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 no. Um, I'm a commercial agent, I did not do theatrical because I don't like to read that much. <laughs> so uh, I don't want to read many paragraphs, I just want a short, sweet, to the point, a picture, a resume, if you have like a little something you've done, perfect. What, what about showcases, or I mean, I don't know anything about them, but that, those things where actors go and perform. I actually and went people, to CBS you know. showcase today, a diversity oh. showcase today. Okay. A lot of those people are repped already. Okay. Um, but yeah, those showcases do get a lot of people looking for, you know, new talent for sure. And to piggyback on that, and I, maybe you can back this up, 
A no is just a no for right now. You don't know in six months from now. You don't well, know. I always say that. I say yeah. you don't know where we'll be. You know, I could have someone who's like you who in six months gets a show and they're gone or they move to New York or, you know, change agents or whatever. So you never know. I mean, following up appropriately is, is okay too. And I think that's go back to that long-term mindset of just staying in contact and never knowing when the one thing's going to land that makes you say yes versus the four times before you said no. Because that's all out of your control. It's just your job to stay in touch. Stay in touch. And also, same with auditions. You can audition for someone, not get it. They can bring you back from something at another time. Five years later, someone was telling me a client of his auditioned for the same casting director 13 times, never got cast, got cast, and is up for an Academy Award. This was a couple of years ago. So after 13 times, you know, he kept thinking, I'm, I'm not giving up, I'm not giving up. So you never know. But obviously, the casting director Loved liked him, him yes. and kept bringing him back. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's the same thing for directors. You know, you will, you'll call you'll call people back you love until you find something that's right. Exactly. Never know when that is. Never know when that is. Um, one last question. I think um, doesn't have a name, so it's anonymous. Um, this goes in context with staying in touch. What is best ways? We kind of heard from agents. What is best ways to stay in touch with casting offices and and casting directors? Is this is postcard something that is like that's old school and doesn't work do you guys always open up your mail does your the offices you work for open up your mail kind of just speak about staying in contact with the other people an actor might want to stay in contact with it's it's a great question i i'm not a postcard fan um i'd say nine out of ten offices throw postcards away but i say that there, there's one out of ten will we'll keep them um so it's not a complete waste in my opinion I, Commercial casting directors are tough unless they're accessible in some way. Like um, Michael Sanford, for example, is very visible on social media. He's gonna love that I try to put his name out there. Um, but he's always, and Instagram. Yeah, right. Yeah, Instagram, Twitter. These are, in my opinion, these are non-invasive ways to be aware of the work a casting director is doing. You can like, retweet, comment on on something. You know, don't do it with the expectation that they're like, well, that comment was super witty. Let's call them in for an audition. It's not not that, um, but but that's a nice way to stay in touch. Uh, and if you know the casting director, if you if you have had face to face time with them and you have their contact info, then appropriately staying in touch about, oh, hey, my agent's been updated, or here's my here's the latest work that I did, um, that sort of thing. So. Yeah, commercially that can be kind of, but but again, like you can always ask. Every office is so so different, so you feel free to ask the session director, or the lobby assistants, um, you know, because you'll most likely see them and not the the casting office people. But ask us, just always ask us. Hey, what's the best way to stay in touch with this office? And sometimes you might get like, eh, you know, they're not really. Once in a while, you might get people that just do not want to be contacted. But yeah, ask and see what that office prefers, you know, and social media. Great. Um, we like to wrap it up usually with kind of what we call the golden nugget question. Uh, the golden nugget, kind of <laughs> like the, the like, and the way we say this is we've talked about a lot tonight, but if you wanted one person to remember one thing of everything we talked about, what would be that one thing you'd want an audience person or someone watching to remember of all the things we said? So I'll give you a second. Think about like if you had a chance to say, hey, don't forget this one thing. If it's two, it's okay. I promise. I won't, I won't hit you. <laughs> What would be that one thing maybe? I'll start over, we'll start at the end with Diane. What would be that one thing that you would want them to remember? Stalk everyone. Follow these people home. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm really kidding, 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 kidding. Um, really, I would say you, you started in this business because your heart drove you there. Um, it takes a lot of guts and courage to be an actor and do it because you love it and don't ever give up. I think that's, you know, the biggest thing for me, too. I mean, that's what I say. You're doing what you love. Follow it. You know, emulate someone's uh, career or, or who they are, you know, and, and don't give up. Just, you know, keep going. You love it. You're doing it. Don't give up on your dream because there are a lot of people doing jobs and doing things in the city that they do not want to be doing. Um. 
I'm going to, I don't want to plagiarize him, but I will, I will quote him. Uh, James Eckhouse said this thing to me just recently, and I, and I love it, and it really taught me a lot. This concept of being the acting department. You guys are all actors, and that is your department. Um, I, think it's, I think it's difficult. I don't think it, it's something that comes naturally to us to think of it that way. Like you're the wardrobe department, for example, and you come into a job and, and the production says to you, hey, we want people to look like they're from the 1800s. The wardrobe department's gonna come back with, okay, well, where are they, what city, this and this, and this. like asking questions and getting clarification on what, what the industry wants from you, what a director wants from you, that kind of, like having, having ownership over your department is a very empowering thing. So that's, like I said, it's been super helpful to me because it's, it's clarified for me what, you know, the, the few things that are worth focusing on as, as you're heading up your department. And, and the beautiful thing is you can let all the other crap go. You're not the editing department, you're not the cinematographer, you are not the casting director. Let those other people do their jobs. And I hope you guys can walk away from tonight knowing that there are plenty of people in the business that you can trust to head up their departments. And that's what we want to trust you guys to head up yours. Like we do want you to succeed. Also, um, when you guys end up in my uh, audition room, which I'm sure you all will, just remind me that you saw me here and I'll get obnoxious. Oh my God, great, let's work on this audition and make it wonderful. Oh um, lady. Yeah, that's, like, that's, that's the best part of my day, you know? So, so definitely. Let me know that you guys came to this when you're in my room. I'm going to be super specific, and I would just say, be prepared and be on time. I think that's a good place to end. Let's yes. tap that out. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for spending our time with us. Thank you for everyone coming. We um, enjoyed it. We all enjoyed it. And have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you next time. Thank you guys. <laughs>